right behind you. Good morning. I'm Donald Ware, here to introduce Maurice Cottrell from England, now living in Ireland. I find his uh, title today very intriguing, The Secrets of the Super Gods. Maurice is an engineer and a scientist. He has a deg degrees in electrical and communications engineering and a degree in business. He did speak here uh, about 10 years ago at our conference. We found that interesting. He is an author of six books. I believe you see the titles up there, ranging from the Mayan prophecies in 1995 to the Celtic Chronicles 2005. I don't want to take any more of his time, so let me introduce, please welcome Maurice Cottrell. Thanks. Hi there. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry about the confusion this morning. Uh, I find this everywhere I go. People are trying to be helpful, and they, they offer me a Rolls Royce, and all I want is a Model T Ford. And uh, it often presents problems like this. The difficulty with this kind of material is that it's just so unusual, it's so very, very unusual. Now, you may think, what's this got to do with UFOs? Well, it's got a great deal to do with UFOs, as we'll see as the morning unfolds. Now, I always feel, uh, when I begin a talk like this, it reminds me of uh, the old story about the guy who goes into a shoe shop, and the assistant says, what size do you take? And he says, well, I normally take an eight, but nine feels so much more comfortable, I think I'll have a 10. <laughs> However, it's a sort of back-to-front way of uh, an analogy using that story, because normally this stuff takes about 16 hours to talk about. I've done it in eight hours, and today I've got to do it in three and a half. So I'll just, uh, by way of introduction, I'll just try and describe how I got interested in this kind of, uh, this area of research, which covers everything in life. There's, there's no stone unturned that this doesn't touch. When I was eight years old, I used to keep pigeons as a small boy in Manchester, England, where I grew up. And uh, I used to take the pigeons about five miles away on my bicycle and release them. And I noticed that the birds flew around once or twice in a circle and then headed for home across the horizon. And as they went, they zigzagged all the way until it, they got home before me, of course, because I went back and they were already home. And I began to question, how could a, a, a pea-brained, or a bird with the size of a pea, find its way home over such long distances. I had to wait another 12 years after that until I went to sea in the Merchant Navy in England as a radio officer. And I was standing on board, the, uh, the, the, standing in the wheelhouse on board the ship, uh, and we were in a storm. And every time a wave came over, the ship went to the left, and I noticed the gyro compass would skew around, and then the rudder at the back would go the opposite way, and the ship would come back on course. And when I looked at the course recorder, I could see the course recorder was following a zigzag. So it seemed to me that the pigeons must be sensing the magnetic field, just like the gyro compass was sensing uh, the movement of the ship. So I, I, I joined my first ship. Uh, it was in uh, February 1970. We sailed down the Manchester Ship Canal, and I begin to notice behavioral changes in the crew. When we went north to south, they were quite happy. But when we started going east to west, they all started to argue. And I watched this over the years that followed, the 12, 13 years that followed, and I started to analyze the behavior of the crew and consider what might be making their behavior change as we moved from left to right. Now, in those days, those were the days of the brand new jetliners, the 707. And uh, jet lag was really unheard of then. But we became more familiar with the fact that when we move across the magnetic lines of force on the Earth, that uh, our brains are affected, and we produce more or less of the timing hormone melatonin. Since then, we've come a long way uh, with understanding how uh, the endocrine system hormones work. I became very interested in astrology, or the, the determination of personality. How could the astrologers, as the astrologers say, the stars affect a human being? 
Well, being rational and logical, I decided it's got to have something to do with the genes. It's got to be in the genes. There must be a scientific explanation for all this. After all, I'd seen the effects on board ship. So, I guess I was born at a lucky time because there were many changes in uh, scientific discoveries during the 70s and 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Many scientific discoveries around the time. One of them, for example, in 1957, was the discovery of the Van Allen belts, the belts of radiation uh, that encircle the Earth. And James Van Allen, the American engineer who worked at NASA, discovered these in 1957. And uh, we now understand that these belts absorb the radiation from the sun and protect the Earth. In 1961, the next development came from Mariner 2 spacecraft. And uh, Mariner 2 spacecraft sent back signals of particles that were de being detected from the sun. At the time, we couldn't understand what they are, but now we're familiar with them. And the sun, it was seemed, was spinning and sprinkling out particles towards the Earth. Positive particles for seven days, negative particles for seven days, positive particles for about four, and then we get some mixture here of both, and then another sector of particles. Now these particles, the positive charges are the nuclei of the hydrogen atom as we get nuclear fusion in the sun. The negative particles are electrons that are smashed off the atom, and we now know they travel to Earth and they get caught up in these Van Allen belts. Now I've put together this model of the sun, and uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? sphere, uh, and uh, that's better, put it there. And This is the sun and this is the earth, and the earth goes around the sun once every 365 days. We now know that the sun has four bubbles of magnetic field around its equator, one, two, three, four, and it has a north pole and a south pole. Every 11 years, the north pole changes polarity, the top becomes minus, the bottom becomes positive. Now, in the next three or four minutes, you're going to get slightly confused. And you say, what's this guy talking about? This is, uh, you know, this is out of my area of activity. I need to go through this process just for a few minutes, and then you'll understand why I want to confuse you for a few minutes. So let me make it quite clear. Now, what I did was, in 1989, while working at Cranfield University, I, I had a question of, how long would it take the three magnetic fields or the three uh, parameters? Excuse me. <laughs> okay. The sun, now we know from Mariner 2, spins every 28 days. And we know the Earth goes round every 365 days. But we also have the planet Mercury here, on here. And Mercury moves round every 87 days. So Mercury moves four degrees a day around the sun. And as it does so, the gravitational field and the magnetic field pull the middle of the sun around more quickly than the top and the bottom. So I asked a question, when would the polar magnetic field, that's the blue one, and the, and the equatorial magnetic field come back together if they started off? And I, I was working at Cranfield, so I had access to the biggest computer at the time in the UK. And I wanted to know when these three variables would all be back together, because that would be a cycle of magnetic activity. Now, I knew that this one, the North Pole, rotates every 37 days. If you're on the Earth, because the Earth has moved during that 37 days, it takes longer. It's 40 days altogether. The equator goes around once every 26 days. But if you're on the Earth, it takes two days longer to line up 28 days. So I thought there had to be a way of calculating when these two magnetic fields and the Earth are all in a line again. Astronomers said, this is impossible. You've got one magnetic field there and one magnetic field there. How can you describe the Sun's magnetic field with regard to the Earth? It's impossible. So I thought about this, and I thought, well, it's not impossible, because I know every 87 days they overlap. This, the pole is overlapping the equator every 87 days. They're both moving, but every 87 days, the North Pole overlaps the equator. So I thought, if I close my eyes,